Join us on the program Beyond 100 Days. I am Abosedi Adenio Adoremi. You can join the conversation on X. Use the hashtag Beyond 100 Days and tag TVC News NG. We are staying on the recent judgment by the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja, setting aside the impeachment of Philip Shaibo as Deputy Governor of Edo State and stating that it was in violation of the law, unconstitutional, null and void. The impeachment was in violation of Section 188 and Section 35 of the Constitution. The court ordered that Philip Shaibo's salaries and emoluments be paid to him from the 8th of April when he was illegally impeached till the expiration of his tenure. The court restrained Governor Gordon Obaseki and the State House of Assembly from stopping him from performing his duties as Deputy Governor. And in a swift reaction, the Edo State Government has filed a stay of execution. The Commissioner for Communication and Orientation, Chris Nehihari, says the incumbent Deputy Governor, Omobaya Godwins, remains and continues to serve as the Deputy Governor pending the hearing of the appeal of the judgment. And in another development, Justice James Omotosha of the Federal High Court Abuja has dismissed a suit by the embattled Deputy Governor of Edo State, Philip Shaibo, and others seeking to void Asue Igodalo's nomination as a candidate of the People's Democratic Party in the forthcoming governorship election in Edo State. In a judgment, Justice Amotosho held that the suit which challenged Mr. Igodalo's qualification on the grounds that he allegedly forged his voter's card was statute barred. Justice Amotosho held that the suit being a pre-election case was filed outside the 14 days allowed under Section 285, Subsection 9 of the Constitution. The judge also held that even though forgery or non-possession of voters' card was a disqualifying factor under Section 182 of the Constitution, the plaintiff failed to prove that Mr. Igodalo forged his voters' card as alleged by the plaintiff. The judge dismissed the case for lacking in merit. Well, interesting development from Edo State to help examine the legal implication of all of these. Legal practitioner Fred Nziako joins me now via Zoom. Mr. Nziako, it's good to have you join us at this time. As it is, it's exactly 100 days after Philip Scheibe was impeached as deputy governor of Edo State. And now he has been reinstated uh, by court. What's the import of that court's decision? Well, um, the meaning is that uh, Philip Schreiber's uh, impeachment has been nullified by the court as uh, not following due process of law as set down in the Constitution regarding the impeachment of the Deputy Governor, which is also the same process that uh, leads to the impeachment of a governor. You recall that uh, those state House of Assembly had been in Tatas, and um, even as we speak, Nobody is certain whether the assembly is in existence because the assembly had a, a long run running battle with the governor, only for the assembly to come together and the purport to impeach the deputy governor without following the due process of law. I want to salute the judiciary for always coming to the rescue of Nigerian political environment. And uh, when, when the judges try to clean up the audience temple created by the politicians, some people will begin to finger the judges as the challenges of Nigeria. We are not. They are, the, 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 are not only the last hope of the common man, but the last hope of uh, the life and survival of Nigerian democracy. I believe that this judgment is one that uh, can be, should be encouraged, uh, is the one that should be applauded, and is the one that um, should not be uh, drawn beyond this. We understand that. And those state governments had uh, indicated their notice to appeal and had even filed a um, state of execution pending appeal. But I will tell you that um, it, it was done in bad faith uh, because I don't expect uh, a those state government to go that um, route. I expected that Philip Schreiber should resume his office as a substantive deputy governor of a those state as, a, as a ordered by the court. But then, if it is left for the court to either accept or, or reject such a um, uh, uh, notice of appeal, 
or rather such uh, application for stay of execution, that is to, uh, uh, the discretion of the court to accept that or reject it. And I want to urge the Honorable Judge of the Federal High Court to reject such a, an application and uh, insist that Philip Schreiber should resume his position as Deputy Governor of Edo State. But you know, Mr. Aziako, uh, the, the court would only rule on what is before it. It wouldn't just <coughs> award because, you know, members of the public urged it to do that. But, you know, some political watchers are actually saying that perhaps this issue wouldn't have degenerated at this point if Philip Shaibu or Gordon Abaseki had, you know, approached it another way. Talk about maybe Philip Shaibu uh, suspending his ambition until a time that is deemed okay when he's he would be in good terms with his, uh, uh, you know, his, his boss. But, of course, it didn't go uh, that way. Do, do you share that sentiment, really? In as much as um, the, there is a gentleman agreement that has crept into a Nigerian political experiment, whereby the rotation and the zoning formula is usually encouraged and, um, and uh, approved. It is also very important that um, somebody's ambition should not be scuttled on the altar of um, trying to make way for other people. Um, Philip Schwabu had gotten a lot of experience in governance and a lot of experience in, um, in public service, of which he, he was expected. He was expected that um, he should be encouraged to at least try his luck before the Edo public, and if eventually they accept him by way of voting, then he'll become the <laughs> But um, it seems that his ambition had run foul of the expectations of the governor and by the position of the governor, who had always been his ally, and uh, they now fell apart on account of his ambition. But what we should always ask is, this unwritten agreement uh, that uh, always brings issue of rotation and zoning. Shall we continue on that paradigm? Or shall we now relax to the practice of electing people on the basis of merit, competence, capacity, and experience? It is one aspect that the uh, Nigerian public will have to determine and decide. I hear you, course, Mr. Anziako. So I hear you, but, you yeah. know, talking about rotation, as it is, both Philip Shaibu and uh, Omobayo Gordons, they're actually from Edo North, I mean, the same senatorial zone in, in the state. Yes, uh, both are from Edo North, and that is why the governor, when Philip, when he orchestrated the impeachment of uh, his former deputy, Philip Shaibu, he still went back to Edo North to bring a replacement uh, in um, uh, the current... Uh, Deputy Governor, um, because of the fact that he wanted to stick to and maintain the, the rotation arrangement that he wanted to ensure that it takes root uh, in a those states. And of course, um, and he did not expect that any other person will come to run from a donor. But um, uh, uh, in some cases, because these are unwritten gentleman agreements, even at the presidential level, most party faithfuls always go against such an arrangement, and it is left for the party to determine whether they will run or not. But the governor went for the kill by ensuring that Philip Schwabu was impeached as a deputy governor. All right. Now, talking about, you know, the party and the infighting, in another development, the courts today also dismissed Philip Shaibu's suit, uh, which is seeking to void Aswe Godala's nomination as a PDP governorship candidate. It, it does appear that the PDP is divided against itself. Do you see the PDP able to resolve all of these issues against an APC that is seeking a return to power in the South-South state and other parties like the Labour Party that has former NBA chairman Olumide Akpata as candidate. From experience, we know that any house that is divided against itself usually don't succeed at general elections. If um, we have seen that over and over again, we saw that play out in 2023 presidential election, and we have always seen that play out in many states. Once any political party does not approach a, a, a major election with unity of purpose and with cohesion, 
and uh, and tie together as um, as one family working towards a common front is usually very difficult for such party to succeed. And uh, I'm sure that PDP should have that at the back of their mind uh, because if the, their house is scattered and disorganized, then um, they will have left a lot of cracks in, in their wall for lizards and war geckos to cl climb through and uh, come in and mess up their chances. Uh, but um, they still have time to, to, to bring themselves together because um, election is in September and uh, they have uh, just less than uh, two months or thereabouts. And if they don't quickly smoothen up the cracks, then um, the result will likely show at the general election come September. You just mentioned they still have time to bring themselves together. How should that coming together be? Should it be in the law courts or should it be a political gentleman's agreement? No, oh, coming, such coming together can only be done by political settlement, political understanding, give and take, and um, um, uh, not a, a decision of winner takes all. And then um, assuage the feelings of those who are incensed and pacify those who are angry and then bring the family together so that they will approach the election as uh, one common family that is united. But if they fail to do so, I think they will have a lot of challenges because the opposition is warming up very seriously to take over. And uh, the opposition, having seen the ch challenges of, um, of uh, discord and the disunity that have crept into the ruling party in Edo State, they want to capitalize on that to approach all, all right. the major elements and all the major positions in the ruling party in order to torpedo their chances in the next election. All right, Mr. Nziako. Legal practitioner, Fred Nziako, thank you very much for talking to us on the program. Many thanks. After the break, we turn our attention to Enugu State to examine some developments there. Please stay with us. Welcome back. The federal government and Enugu State in the southeast region of Nigeria have launched action plans to significantly redevelop the mining sector in the Coal Ridge State. At the inaugural meeting of the Enugu State Chapter of the Mineral Resources and Environmental Management Committee, the chairman, Samuel Okoro, outlined the committee's plans to enhance the productivity of the mining sector, tackle economic sabotage and non-compliance, which, according to him, have severely impacted both on the economy and the environment. To further dissect the mining sector in the coal Ridge Enugu State, Chairman, Mineral Resources and Environmental Management Committee, Samuel Okoro, joins me on the program from our Abuja studios. Good to have you join us on the program, Mr. Okoro. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, there are discussions around significantly redeveloping the mining sector, especially in Enugu State. What is the strategy? I didn't get the last part, sorry. Yes, I'm asking what the strategy is to develop the mining sector in Enugu State. Okay, okay. The strategy is, uh, is simple. We have the resources, and uh, like you all know, Enugu State was the first state to commence mining in Nigeria in 1909, when, it, when we started coal mining. But along the line, when we discovered oil, we actually fell back. Other states have overtaken us now. And going back, we now want to bounce back in full force because uh, the governor, current governor, His Excellency Dr. Peter Mba, when he went, before he was elected, made promises to revamp all our dormant assets and turn them into a, into, into a viable economic opportunity to develop the state. And the mineral resources in the state happens to be one of those assets that have been dormant over the years. So when we now came on board, we, we looked at the challenges we are facing, facing the sector and actually stalling development in the sectors. And uh, we identified them and we are tackling them head on. Part of which uh, was, uh, that's why we brought out this uh, pre press acronym. We, st we, st we stood for productivity, revenue generation, environment environmental management, and safety. Part of the, part of the what actually stores production is the non-utilization uh, of licenses issued by the, uh, by the Mining Cadastral Office to a lot of operators in Enugu. So we are, tr we are working together with both the private sector and the federal government to ensure right. that all licenses issued 
become productive is translated to productivity, which is going to enhance development in the mining sector. I hear you, Mr. Okoro. Now, about uh, over 70 mineral titles have actually been issued, but fewer than 10 are currently operational. But we're also yes. aware that activities of illegal miners are a major challenge. How do you hope to address this? The, the issue of uh, the, the license owners that have not, are not working, uh, we had a meeting, uh, with, uh, Mirinko had a meeting with miners on the 12th of this month, of which uh, we, dis we discussed with them. We told them to come to us with their challenges, the problems why they are not working, so that we can be able to tackle it and so they can go back to work. We also know that they have issue of speculators who are not ready to work, but are committing those licenses so they can sell it at inflated rates at the end of the day. So our, our, our ultimate aim is to be able to sieve the wheat from the chaff get the ones that are ready to work, and then work with the federal government to revoke the ones that are not ready to work and hand it over to the ones that are ready to work. On the issue of illegal miners, before this government came on board, we have a lot of illegal mining activities going on in Enugu. But as of today, I have, it's, a, it's, it's something I'm proud of that we don't have any single illegal miner in Enugu as of today. I made a challenge today at APNIS. If anybody can identify a single illegal miner operating in Enugu today, I made a bet of one million to the person. Because... We had the willpower and a commitment to ensure that the sector works. You can't be asking legal miners to go to work when we know they have a lot of responsibilities. And they'll still be dragging the market with people who have nothing to who have no responsibility at all. who are actually destroying the market. So we took all these uh, strategic and uh, aggressive steps to close down the activities of illegal miners because it destroys our environment, sabotages the economy, and destroys everything, even the communities and sponsors in security. So as of now, we have taken care of illegal mining activities and they are no longer existent in Enugu. All right. Let's, uh, you know, look at another angle to this. The federal government is actually on an ambitious target. They are looking at about 50% of the country's GDP coming from the mining sector. And of course, as you've mentioned, Enugu State has a great role to play. But how do we balance the quest for improved revenue generation with environmental sustainability as we keep talking about climate change. That's good. If you look at the, our, the, the, the Mirren Committee we had, we talked about this because like I always say, man is about community and environment. No, no one has to come before the other. We understand the impact it's going to have on the environment if we, if we increase productivity. That's why we talked about Ensuring that every mine, the, the, the Mining Act has made provision for all this. If you are given a license, you are expected to have an EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, EPRP, water test, and all, all, a lot of certifications and uh, procedures you are so, supposed to have to ensure that we bequeath a sustainable environment to our, the next generation when we're mining. So we are taking very good, uh, we are very meticulous about ensuring that all miners adhere to these regulations. The problem we always identify are that miners go to the offices or the agencies responsible for all these licenses, acquire those licenses, and then not to use them on site. So we have a, money, a team that's on standby to ensure that every regulation in the act or every certification you receive is particularized on site. Because when you follow this act or the regulations the way they are, you're going to mitigate the impact on the environment. So that's why we have the press. The productivity is going in the hand in hand with the environmental management. We want to mine in a very safe manner that's going to leave our environment very safe and sustainable and also have safety for people who are in the mine and the communities surrounding it. All right, that Mr. Koro, we as we tend to manage this too. Okay, as we wrap up the conversation, I'm curious as to what the current figures are as to how much the mining sector in Enugu State generates and what your projection is. Now, what's the time frame? What are you hoping to generate? The mining sector in Enugu today generates uh, less than 60 million annually. Our projection in, is in 18 months to be able to generate, in 18, 24 months, to be able to increase that to 2 billion for a start. Because if we have, if we have only seven operating and we have this figure, if we have up to 70 or 70 of them operating, you know, there's going to be exponential growth in that, in that regard. So that's why we are pushing to have all of them working. Because if they're working, 
they will create more revenue for the federal government. And again, employment, because try, striving to achieve zero hand count the rate of poverty is not what you can do alone as government. We need the private sector to participate in that development, that, in that uh, aspect. That's why I want all of them to work. And the ones that are not able to work, to give the title or partner with people who are ready to use that title. Because when we, are, when we all start, if they start operating, then we can be able to achieve what we are planning, what, what we are projected for us to achieve. That is our, our, our target for the next two years. All right. Well, that's quite ambitious because then you're looking at uh, about one billion nine hundred and forty million. You know, we can only wish you the best in the quest to get this done. Chairman, Mineral Resources and Environmental Management Committees uh, in Enugu State, Samuel Okoro. Thank you so much for talking to us on the program. Thank you very much. Well, that's our program today. We thank you very much for spending time with us. Do watch a repeat broadcast at midnight and at 6 a.m. I am Abbas.